Dr. Brown, thank you so much for being on the podcast. And I would love to know a little bit about kind of your research and writing process as you were putting together this new commentary on the book of Philippians. Absolutely. Um, I've taught a class on Philippians for an upper level Greek sequence, you know, so working through the Greek of Philippians a number of times. And that's just always a nice place to start from. So I had spent time in the text. I had started to delve into the secondary literature, meaning commentaries or articles, sometimes even monographs on a topic in Philippians, people's dissertations. I just done a little bit of that work. Um, so uh, my process was to really stretch into reading the text again and again and thinking of its structure and how it holds together, all the while starting to do more reading um, around the letter, its context, its historical setting. Um, I was helped along because I was asked to write the Philippians entry for the Dictionary of Palm's Letters, the revised version, which will be coming out maybe next year, something oh. like that. So I was, that really required me to, um, you know, pull in resources on historical context to think about the theology of the letter. Again, all the while, um, continuing to read the letter over and over again. I think of commentaries as really offering us this nice triangle of literary analysis, historical backdrop with that historical backdrop in view, and then pointed towards thinking sort of with the theology of the letter. What is Paul trying to communicate the messages and the theological um, themes? That kind of triangle really helps me think about what we're up to. All commentaries do all of that work, and some are weighted a little more in one area than the other. So I was trying to attend to all those pieces and then just to start to work through the letter in terms of writing the commentary. And that would, I would dive into a section of the letter. I have, I have 10 sections across the commentary that uh, the commentary is divided into based on 10 kind of key segments of the letter. And once I dove into that section I was writing on, then there would be new issues that would be raised and, you know, fine points of grammar. And I had to determine what... What do I really address? Because every commentary is selective. Mm. And uh, to the Tyndale series is meant to be very accessible for a lay audience, a pastoral audience, um, doesn't require knowledge of the Greek. So I just needed to make my decisions based on my audience, my interests, and then what I was seen as, as important in the, in the text, in the, in the text of Philippians that I felt really needed some comment. So it's kind of a, a really interesting mix of making choices and uh, and then sitting down to write and then rewriting and rewriting so that it, it becomes clearer to the reader. What did you find as being like, I guess, most helpful in your research? Because I'm sure you had so many resources, so many, you just listed a bunch of different things you were looking at. What did you find most helpful? And then also, what were some like kind of some areas where maybe that book or resource wasn't as uh, helpful to you? Because I think about, for those that are listening in, who maybe want to be good Bible readers and take their Bible critically, um, maybe like how to help them sort through mm -hmm. uh, resources as they're studying a text like Philippians. Yes, I, I find it's helpful to have a couple of commentaries. Uh, if I were reading it, um, if I were writing a commentary on it, having just a couple of commentaries for a couple different perspectives and to raise some key issues that I may not be aware of if I if I don't know Greek and I'm reading um, Philippians, oh, a co couple commentaries both pointing out something or pointing out different perspectives on the, the same language um, can help me to realize that, that that's kind of a key issue. So I think it's helpful to have a companion commentary um, as we're reading the text the biblical text. Um, for me, it was probably having a few more of those on my desk. Fair enough. You know, I needed to hear what were the key issues. And sometimes I'd need four or five commentaries to get to something. Oh, that nobody else has mentioned that piece. Um, I, you know, some of my favorites, I mean, Gordon Fee's commentary from the 90s is just an amazing resource. Um, Lisa Silva's commentary and the Baker Exodal commentary. I, I appreciated that. And he, they're both text critics. So when it comes to determining the original wording of Philippians, when there are manuscripts that differ, the manuscript tradition differs at some points, they're just great people to go to for that kind of material, which I don't always write on because sometimes it's not terribly significant to the English reading of the text, but sometimes it is. So 
Um, I also enjoyed Marcus Bachmuel's commentary, Lynn Coick's commentary. Um, uh, toward the end, I discovered and should have discovered earlier, but I wasn't hearing it cited much. It's relatively new. Elsa Tamas's commentary um, uh, and um, uh, uh, an African scholar. So um, really helpful uh, helping me think through some of the issues of the financial support Paul gets from this church since Paul is uh, in prison and has few resources in this Community has few resources, according to Paul in 2 Corinthians as well. He's talked about the churches of Macedonia didn't have much, but they gave anyway. Um, that kind of setting to think about Paul's final thank you to the Philippians was really helpful. So, uh, you know, lots of conversation partners for me, and, and I tried to make sure those conversation partners were represented in my footnotes. Mm. So if people are reading along in my commentary and they go, well, that's interesting. And they see there's a footnote and that's Elsa Tammons or that's Marcus Bachmuel or someone else. They can say, oh, I might want to check out that commentary um, because I really hear that as uh, that commentary may be addressing some of my interest areas and questions and issues. Um, there are also, you know, a host of monographs, people's dissertations on Philippians um, and articles on really interesting passages there's a ton of material on chapter 2, 6 through 11, the, what's called the Christ hymn or the Christ poem, um, how Christ, um, though in the form of God, did not count equality with God, something to be um, taken advantage of, that section. Uh, just huge volumes written on it. So that gets a little thicker in terms of footnoting in my commentary, but I try to always make um, the scholarship accessible you know, the scholarship I'm hearing, uh, one really helpful resource uh, that I just relied on um, quite often for the historical context and thinking about that Philippian church in Philippi in the first century, Peter Oak's work on Philippians from letter to people. I think that's the direction it goes, mm -hmm. but it's just a little book that talks about um, who might be in that congregation. How do we picture that? And that was really a helpful imaginative historical exercise for me to think about the people. We hear about a few of them in the letter, right? We hear about Epaphroditus, we hear about, um, and then Clement, and then we hear about Yoda, Yoda and Syntyche. But we, there are other people, of course, that aren't named, and how do we kind of picture that, the composition of that church within a Roman colony, though they're not all Roman, because it's a Greek city. So mm. how do we kind of picture that mix? And I found his work really insightful and helpful to imagine a congregation so that the letter made mm. more sense and kind of landed, the wording landed in this place. And I brought those together in my mind. And that was really productive. I love that. So as you're just going through all these various uh, commentaries and dictionaries and different resources, how did you begin to kind of take and decide on what were the main themes of Philippians mm -hmm. that you wanted to focus on? Yes. Um, well, uh, as I wrote through the commentary, kind of verse by verse, um, I really did ask that question of what rises to the, to the level of really having a, a, um, requiring comment whether it's a kind of confusing language mm. or a reference to somebody or something that we're, you know, we have to kind of fill that out, uh, like the those who preach Christ out of envy, but who, those who preach out of goodwill. You know, who are those mm. people? Where are they? They're wherever Paul's imprisoned, most likely. I mean, that seems to be the... So just knowing kind of where to land and talk, um, as I kind of lift my head out from the detail of the text, that's when it's so much easier to see what I think everyone sees when they read Philippians, which are these rich themes, um, like joy. You know, it is a letter of joy. Unity. Um, and those those qualities within a, a context of suffering. Um, uh, examples of the faith. Timothy, Epaphroditus, Paul himself, and of course, Jesus is the key example, right? Let your mindset be that of Christ Jesus, 2-5. Um, so imitation is a theme in the letter. Um, participation or partnership, because Paul really considers the Philippians partners in the gospel. So the gospel becomes a, an important theme. So I think we see those just by reading a letter, you know, a lot of times um, in a row, those four chapters, you start to see all those themes. And part of the interesting thing for me, as I think about themes, is how do they, 
weave together? You know, how do they inform one another? It's not just about unity, but unity in the midst of suffering and potentially suffering that's dividing the community. That's Peter Oakes mm -hmm. uh, and some of his insight. So um, how do those themes kind of weave together? That becomes the really interesting piece as a commentary writer, thinking about how do I express the coherence of the letter as I see it? And kind of give a coherent picture of that in the end. Can you talk about some of those um, those beautiful ways you saw the weaving of these different themes um, that maybe you didn't see before? Uh, yes. Um, yeah, they're just so rich. One of the themes that feels particularly Philippian-esque, I mean, it's a, a theme we hear really in Philippians, and it's not that it wouldn't show up in other letters of Paul, but not quite in the same way and with the same language. It's the idea of pursuing... Um, the mindset of Christ or a common mindset around Christ. Um, there's language in the Greek, uh, phroneo is the verb, and it's this idea of um, holding or, or, or kind of attaching oneself to this mindset or, or viewing things from the same perspective. It's not just about the head, though. It has a dispositional element to it, as Gordon Fee Mm. emphasizes so that it's like they have this common stance toward the world and toward life and the gospel and toward faith in Christ and that language uh, the language of um, considering um, hege oh my that Paul talks about I consider what I consider gain I can now consider loss it's, it's the same kind of stance toward disposition toward looking at something in a new direct from a new direction that's a really important theme across Philippians that um, our frame of reference has, has shifted. And he calls the Philippians to really engage again and again that frame of reference that Christ exhibited, that then is to be their common frame of reference. So this, this unity is built around this common Christ mindset. Um, and that's just a really powerful theme that he employs across the letter to talk about how he considers his past in chapter 3, but also how the Philippians are to consider um, the values they see around them, whatever is good, lovely, pure, that whole list, whatever is excellent, Irete, chapter 4, verse 8, which is the name of Aristotle's book, Virtue, mm -hmm. the virtues, you know, Irete. Um, think on these things, logizomai, another Greek term that fits this thing, I think, consider these things, evaluate these things. From your gospel lens, Look at the world. You're going to see it differently. And I think that's a really important Philippian uh, theme. We wouldn't have if we, we wouldn't have as clearly if we didn't have this letter of Paul. Um, the idea that the church looks at the world differently, therefore they have a different disposition toward what's around them. And so disposition, that's about allegiance to the gospel, about love, about faith all those kind of amazing virtues that are Christian virtues. That's beautiful. What was, I mean, what are your thoughts on where Paul was as he was in prison? Mm -hmm. What was, like, what was his situation like as he's writing this letter? Yeah, I mean, there's debate on where he's in prison, whether it's Roman, that's to, Rome, that's a traditional view. Um, Ephesus is a common view today, mm -hmm. gaining more ground by critical scholars, like scholar, you know, um, Nietzsche Gupta and, Michael Bird in their Oxford commentary on Philippians argue for Ephesus as well as a number of other scholars. Um, I, I tend to take the, the Roman view, the view that it is Rome, um, because of the number of references uh, in the letter to, you know, to the um, imperial guard um, in chapter one and also Caesar's household in chapter four. Those can refer to entities outside of um, Rome itself, but um, it seems that that's the most natural reading. Um, it, regardless of where he's in prison, he is in um, he is in at sort of a military uh, um, uh, custody. I, I suppose you say military custody. So he's chained. It, it seems that he's manacled or chained to uh, a guard, one or two, maybe one on either side. Um, it's not the kind of the house arrest that the elite got to um, experience, and it wasn't the worst conditions, but probably the, the middle category of prison. Um, and if that's the case, then it, it really helps us to think about Paul as really needing the people around him. 
Timothy is still with him as Epaphroditus brings this letter back to Philippi. Epaphroditus has, had gone to provide Paul with gifts, according to chapter, I think, 418. And then we hear that in 225 through 30 as well. We hear about Epaphroditus, and he got really sick, and so Paul wants to send him back. So they are assured that he's okay, and they can see him kind of healthy and returned. Um, but Paul needs people there. That's why they sent Epaphroditus to just sort of stand in for the congregation to support him. He has, if he's in Rome, he has Roman church members who can visit him and bring food and other supplies to just help him exist and, and um, you know, not become ill and and impoverished and, you know, um, starving and, you know, just to, to have kind of the supplies he needs. And I think that kind of picture helps us to hear Paul's side of the equation rather than whatever other ideas we might think of him in prison um, and maybe having more than I think he has. I don't think he has a lot. And he needs his people. And I think that perspective helps us mm -hmm. to hear his voice in the letter. Um, as wanting to encourage them, I'm okay. I mean, it's the first thing he says, 112 through 26. I'm all right. I'm in prison, but I'm all right. And the gospel is all right. Those are really important encouragements from the get-go. Why does he start there? Because I think they're concerned about him. They know that it's not a good situation. And he does too. And he envisions, well, you know, he might go to trial and he might be convicted and he might be executed. But he's more confident that he's going to remain with them, remain here and then be able to return to them. So that whole situation, I think, is illuminated by this. This is not a great prison situation, if there is such a thing. And I guess this gets back to what you were saying about reframing the situation, because he was yes. pointing out, like, his situation is not good, but he's reframing it as he's, he's joyful. He is so mm -hmm. grateful to have the church, and he wants to encourage the church. Um, and I guess this is that what you talk talking about this gospel lens that Paul had. Yes, and because the gospel is doing all right, he's doing all right, you know. And because they're doing all right, he's doing all right. That's the beautiful thing. Um, the whole passage, twelve through twenty six, is framed in verses I think it's twelve and twenty five. But this language of um, the progress, the progress of the gospel, their progress mm. in faith and joy. Um, he cares about those things. It's always the case that if we care about the gospel, we'll care about the people who um, are impacted by the gospel. It's not this entity we're committed to. It's to Christ and to Christ's people. Um, and you really see that um, fleshed out nicely in that first passage, 12 through 26 of chapter 1. What I thought was interesting is, and um, you just mentioned, like he doesn't talk about the gifts that were sent until like chapter 4. Mm -hmm. And you would think about, like I was thinking if I was writing a letter to somebody, like I would like start off by like thanking people like, oh, thank you so much for sending these financial gifts. Um, is there, do you see anything there and like why, like he waited till the end? That is a question that scholars ask routinely. And it's fair because even the um, 4, 10 through 20 at the end, the thanks part in quotation marks, it's a thankless thanks. In other words, he never quite <laughs> says, thank you. Somebody calls it in German. They use German, but it's thankless thanks. Um, so it's a very fair question. And some have argued be, that it's, you know, a separate letter that that was mm. sent separately, you know, that, it, that we don't have kind of all of Philippians sent at once um, originally. Um, I hold to the integrity of the letter. I think there's good reason, especially in an oral co context, for understanding the letter in the shape that it is. And coming at the end, Gordon Fee emphasizes that it would just leave that thanks, or the implicit thanks at least, ringing in their ears. There's a way that landing at the end um, is, a, is a very good move. Um, and people like Stephen Fowle and others also emphasize how much continuity there is between chapter one, three through 11, that Thanksgiving section to God and the thanks at the end of the letter to the Philippians. And the partnership that's mentioned in chapter 1, I think it's 6 or 7, 5 and 7, is really mirrored then in that thank you section as well. So we, he introduces it ever so briefly, you know, or kind of a, uh, alludes to it ever so briefly in the thanks, opening Thanksgiving, but he'll return to it mm. at the end. Um, that's one way people have thought about that. And they... Uh, Stephen Fall and, and others have done really good work on thinking about obligation and giving and gifting in the ancient world and how 
when you say thank you, you need to be careful that you don't obligate the giver to give more. That's, you know, mm. the contentment, contentment that he talks about in chapter 4, 10 through 13. Paul is, I think, trying to say, I don't need you to send more. You know, there's a, mm. a gratefulness, but a, a sense that God is providing, and I am content, and I can be content with almost nothing. Mm. Um, and also, you want to be careful that you talk about these things so that then you're not required to, necess- you know, the, the reci- reciprocity is really tricky or just complicated in the ancient world or you know people were aware of it and and uh, uh, addressed it adjusted to it in ways that we're not quite aware of because we don't have the same kinds of reciprocity um conventions so that i was helped a lot by that kind of discussion and and that shows up in my commentary as well talking about what was expected was not and it's the beauty of how paul ends that which is god will supply all your needs Mm. It's not just a two-way reciprocity in the end. It's a triangle. So God will supply their needs. God is supplying him the contentment he needs. There's just this beautiful theological framing of the whole and Christological framing because Jesus is in the middle of that as well. So, um, yeah, I think it ends on a high note in a sense. It's a wonderful way to end. And then there's a very brief three verses at the end, you know, just really quick kind of exit or, you know, concluding, closing sections so that the Thanksgiving continues to kind of reverberate. Fee would say that at least. You mentioned, uh, I think it's chapter two, verses six through 11, where we have that hymn, Mm -hmm. uh, a beautiful hymn. And I'm curious, like, as you are now thinking back um, on that section and all your research, what, what, what did you find? What did you find maybe surprising or something that we often miss when we read that hymn? Yes. I was struck by how struck I was by that. I mean, I know that (laughs) passage. We all know it. I mean, uh, you know, who, though being in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Rather, he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave. Um, That's the first stanza. Um, I was struck by how poetic it looked to me. It sounded to me. And there's a debate there on, uh, is this elevated prose? That's actually Gordon Fee's language. And many have followed his thoughtful, careful work. But there are others who say, no, this is truly um, a poem. Yes, I mean, uh, it has, it, it sounds, um, has some Jewish parallelism in it. it. It sounds like Paul's Jewish backdrop uh, and poetry in that context, at least to a certain extent. And so people have, you know, outlined it as a poem back to, um, uh, Jeremias in the 40s mm. of the 19th or 20th century, um, all the way up to um, Bachmuel, Marcus Bachmuel, Moises Silvald, and Coeck. Uh, so there are a variety of commentaries that emphasize that. One thing I really appreciate about Silva's work is he talks about how that has exegetical purchase. In other words, if we mm. if we think it's a poem, we should read it as a poem, and that makes a difference interpretively, mm. which of course makes huge sense. If, if we're in the genre of prose and, and we move to poem here, we should read it as such. One of the ways I do that in the commentary is to note that the first stanza really moves us from Christ's exalted status, though he was in the form of God, he now becomes ego, all the way to a slave. The doulos language I think there should be rendered slave versus servant. Hmm. Um, because it's like from the highest place to the lowest place. And then the second stanza introduces um, the incarnation more particularly, kind of hones in on that and being made in the likeness of human beings and being found in appearance as a human being, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death all the way to death on a cross. So uh, the, the, the second stanza helps us to hear kind of the, um, the embrace of humanity or the becoming human um, and uh, Susan Eastman has this lovely language of, um, or she has a title of one of her articles, Imitating Christ, Imitating Us. You know, that he has imitated us in the incarnation, mm. and we are in this whole poem supposed to imitate Christ. It was, you know, the two five setup to the whole thing is in your relationships with one another, have this, the mindset of Christ Jesus, um, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, and then the poem. So, I hear the two stanzas as, um, of course, related, but discrete in the sense of they do kind of two different things. 
uh, to help us hear how much Christ embraced humanity, our form, our place, and what that means for us as we imitate him. Um, it's not just one piece. The other, another piece is uh, simply that um, language functions different in poetry. You have a lot of synonyms used rather than repetition of the same term, which can happen more in prose, more often in prose. And you have lots of different terms for the same kind of idea, and, and you see, you know, people saying why this language, why this word, this word, this word, and I think it's helpful to say, well, these are essentially saying similar things. Not that they're identical and we should ignore their contours, but that's what poetry does. It, it uses fresh language to kind of repeat and slightly nuance the last, um, but with this kind of single idea in mind sometimes. So I found that helpful. And it's something I've continued to work on because I have some lectures in the fall I'm giving at Acadia College and one of them will be on Philippians 2, mm. 5 through 11. Um, and it's the topic, generally speaking, is um, genres and other genres. So embedded genres. So oh, what is, what's Paul doing with, does Paul break into song in chapter 2 of Philippians, you know, in a letter? Yeah. Is Paul kind of, and then I'm looking at other examples of really significant genre shifts in within a bigger book that's a different genre. So I'm doing a little bit of that. So I'm you're, still you're, uh, yeah. excited about it. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, so in that song, in that poem, uh, you're you're pointing out in the second part, like showing the humility, like Christ becoming a mm -hmm. slave. Um, I heard one pastor talking about how maybe maybe that idea of humility is is also echoed in like the beginning of. Uh, Philippians, where Paul doesn't call himself an apostle, is that something that would be mm. appropriate to say that? Well, especially because the other occur uh, um, occurrence of doulos sh shows up there, douloi, um, Paul and Timothy, douloi of Christ Jesus, slaves of or servants of. You know, it can be translated either way, but these are the two occurrences in the letter of that language. And Paul can often call himself an apostle, and he does so sometimes in letters where he needs to kind of assert his apostleship. I think mm. of 1 Corinthians right away. And in chapter 9, am I not your apostle kind of idea, right? Um, you know, so he, he, he never calls himself the Philippians apostle. The only time that language shows up in Philippians is when it talks about Epaphroditus as your apostolos, your messenger probably, not probably apostle in the mm. technical sense or semi-technical sense. But he never calls himself that or Timothy that. So... I do think it's, he, he has a, there's such a warm relational stance. He doesn't have to exert any authority and he'll do that if he needs to, right? He, you know, and he has to offer a corrective. I think the omission of, omission of that, the, the sense that he, he calls them, he and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus, uh, means that he's offering this sort of reciprocal and partnership picture of the Philippians and himself that's very warm and connected. Such a connected letter, relational connected letter. Who knew that the Paul of Galatians and Romans could look <laughs> this connected to, you know, <laughs> and I say that kind of tongue in cheek, but you know, cause I, but I do think it's interesting that we've created kind of a picture of Paul in our mind that we tend to bring to any of his letters, what Mike Marcus Bachmiel calls, these icons of Paul we carry around in our mm. mental images, mental icons. I think that's a really helpful insight. And I wonder if sometimes because of our Protestant reformational kind of perspective, we take Galatians and bits of Romans and we kind of bring it to this warmer letter and go, oh, there's got to be something up. Because yeah. there are, you know, a variety of people say, no, there's something up here. There's some sort of under the surface tension going on. And I'm like, man, I, I don't read that. Not, you know, not that, they're, that he doesn't have some correctives for them, but it's just this, this warm, rich relationship that has this reciprocity and partnership. And, and maybe I'm just too Pollyanna about it, but um, I hear it in, and, and I kept on hearing it in the letter, even with people suggesting some different ways to read and the letter. I, I wonder if we've not imported that, you know, Galatians, Paul's cranky letter kind of into, into <laughs> this place a little bit more than we ought. So I'm paying attention to the 
the Paul we know in Philippians has been really important to my reading, the sort of the implied reader idea that we pay attention to the Paul we know in here first in this letter before we think about how does that, how do other letters inform this letter? Yeah, I, that is so funny because, um, yeah, now that you mentioned Galatians, I think about, yeah, cranky is probably a good a good, a good way to put it because uh, obviously Paul is really upset um, in mm-hmm. Galatians. And for uh, good reason. Right, and for I good reason, say. yeah. Um, so as you think about Paul uh, being this complex person, mm-hmm. uh, how would you how how would you think of him right now um, after reading and doing so much study of Philippians? Like, yeah. if there was someone to ask you, like, Doctor Brown, like, who is Paul? Uh, nobody wants to hear me answer that question. <laughs> the Gospels, all my born days, you know, of the last twenty years, and I've just, I mean, I have taught Paul. I mean, I've taught Pauline letters and. And I've, again, studied some texts, some of Paul's letters more closely than others. Um, I, I do think it's interesting. I mean, Paul is, it obviously has the most, the greatest number of works in the New Testament. However you number how many are authentically Paul, you still have at least seven individual works that are Paul. Maybe 10, maybe 13. I, you know, I'm not going to weigh in on that just this moment. But um the only other, you know, multi-volume we really have Luke Acts and maybe First Peter, Second Peter, um, and then the Johannine. You know, I mean, so as you think about all those things, but um, I think Paul wins in terms of sheer number, uh, not length, but sheer number. And it strikes me that if you had seven or ten or thirteen correspondences from me to other people in my life, and you tried to craft who is Janine you probably wouldn't do a very good job because it's a small slice of, you know, we don't see Paul working in or, you know, working in Corinth for a number of years. We just don't see that except through these little glimpses and letters and maybe acts, you know, I mean, I take acts seriously as history, um, but how we bring that into understanding a particular letter, I think, you know, you have to think about that really carefully and thoughtfully. Um, but I just don't think we have as much as we sometimes think. Maybe an ancient person, yeah, we have a lot on Paul compared to other ancient people. But again, if you were trying to recreate who I am from 13 of my letters, would you do a very good job? I'm guessing you'd be, your hands would be tied a bit. Mm-hmm. So I, I, that, that's, I mean, I, I think it's fascinating to think about the historical Paul or the canonical Paul, two different kind of Paul's maybe, or the Paul in Philippians. So I, I find it really interesting to think hermeneutically about those those entities and how we f- how we discover and explore. But I, I'm just not convinced we can know the historical Paul really super clearly. We can know what his letters say, I think. And yeah, so I don't know if you want to a follow up question. Yeah, but, you yeah. Know, so I, I, lo- I just no, wonder I... about that. I just wonder. Yeah. And I'm no Pauline scholar, so. Well, I love the way you put that as, as um, kind of these different versions of Paul that we get and mm-hmm. how we need to be very careful as we think about these things is, yeah, these are slices. These are letters. Mm-hmm. These are different versions. Different things are happening. They give us different glimpses of Paul. Um, but yeah, how do we say who someone is like just based on a couple letters here yeah. and there? Uh, Especially think, when the tone is so different in different letters, and he doesn't give us a lot of autobiographical. Chapter three of Philippians gives us more than most places, mm-hmm. and it's highly rhetorical. He he's you know he's talking about past and current perspective so distinctly because that's his point. I no longer consider my life this way, but now my life in Christ this way. So, so I think we have to allow for the letter to be promoting those messages and not giving, you know, um, it's not a mirror picture kind of, it's not here, I'm going to show you a mirror of me. No, I want to tell you how I view my past life as compared to my current existence in the Messiah, the supraordinate identity that I have in Christ with all of you. Yeah. And that, that, uh, that passage uh, in Philippians three, four through 11, uh, where Paul is kind of listing out all of his accomplishments, all mm-hmm. these reasons why uh, he would be considered righteous by most standards. Uh, and he says he counts it all loss. And uh, can you talk a little bit about like that statement of like Paul, like disclosing all of this information about himself and 
which is like, wow, I can't believe like he has this amazing list of, of mm -hmm. things. Um, but then he, he says it's all for loss for the basically righteousness by faith. Yeah, I consider it all a loss. You know, it's, it's again, it's his mindset that shifted, not his actual identity. Um, I found um, Anthony Zaccoli's work on this passage really helpful to me to think about, you know, it's not that his identity no longer has no worth or value. It's that this, this identity in Christ is the one that defines all of he and the Philippians with all of their different ethnic identities and other identities, I suppose, as well. Um, you know, Roman, Greek, and different kinds of Greek, and then non-Greek and non-Roman. And just as that whole group thinks, as they all think about what can bind them together, it is that in Christ status. It is that in Christ identity. Um, so as he kind of considers, and you're right, it's sort of that, what, what would bring me confidence? What would, how would I have viewed my own um, righteousness through the Torah, through Torah faithfulness, not not perfection, but faithfulness. He says, I was blameless. I don't think he's being ironic there. I think he's just saying, you know, I followed the Torah and I knew how to pursue, you know, forgiveness through the Torah because the Torah has built into it, of course, the sacrificial system and atonement for sin and all those things. So he, you know, I don't think he's being ironic and saying, I'm blameless. Of course, we know nobody can ever be blameless. You know, I just think he's, he's saying this was the situation and having met Christ, having been found in him, um, it's a different, I'm in a different, ex, ex, I'm in, the, in, in the eschaton, I'm in a different time, you know, I'm in a different place and time. And it makes all the difference. And to know Christ is all I want. It's all I can think of. To, and it's to know the Messiah, right? That's, I mean, Jesus, the Messiah, has now become everything for all of us. I mean, I think he's trying to, you know, show this as an example of a way to think about our, our life together in Christ. And he talks about um, being found in Christ, gaining Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law or the Torah, like he did, but that which is through and here it's faith in Christ or the faithfulness of Christ, the faithfulness of the Messiah or faith in the Messiah, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I actually read those two uses of pistis uh, as one referring to Christ's pistis and the other one to our own pistis wow. or our own faith. So Christ's faithfulness, because righteousness comes through the faithfulness of Christ. Right. And our faith in what he's done in his faithfulness and that is sort of the footnote in the niv through the faithfulness of christ is allowed in that first instance this is this big pistis christu debate that shows up in paul uh, it makes sense to me that we hear that repetition as it's about christ's faithfulness and our own faith and trust in what christ has done but and that's a debated point but it makes sense for me in this context that for paul it's all about this Christ perspective and leaning into Christ's faithfulness, which we participate by faith in, in the Messiah. We are in this new location of time and place somehow that's in the Messiah, in Christ. And again, that means that everything that came before, this is how we, this is how we are identified. This is how we understand ourselves. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, I know we're up at our time. Um, I guess my last question is around um, how now do you read Philippians after doing all of this work? I mean, you're always studying, right? Uh, right. But as you are, are like devotionally reading Philippians, yeah. um, how does this letter now speak to you? Um, well, I certainly have greater appreciation. I loved the letter before. I remember studying it in college days to lead a Bible study, co lead a Bible study on Philippians. I was given Ralph Martin's little commentary on Philippians in the Tyndale series. So for me to write oh, this cool companion to that, it's just really, it was my first commentary I ever had. And I loved reading the text with the commentary next to it. That was for me really helpful. So greater appreciation though, for all those little nooks and crannies that you discover along the way, right? That, that feed into this bigger picture. Um, certainly aware of the greater complexity of, uh, you know, the text, but, and that doesn't discourage me. It's just like, well, then I, I never come back to the text and say, I have nothing else to learn. That's what, you know, sort of that complexity and that depth 
Um, learning more is exciting for me. And then, um, you know, I mentioned I'm working on chapter two, six through 11 for a, a lecture. So I get to come back to it and revisit it and read more, you know, into the depth of that scholarship and think more about this poetic, whether hymn to Christ or poem about who Christ is that informs who we ought to be. Um, I can't wait to ruminate more. That's beautiful. I, I'm sorry, I have one more question because like as you're talking about it, I'm thinking, gosh, like I love like how much passion you have for Philippians and having studied it so thoroughly, I think about just my like limited time studying a passage and whenever I see it again, like, oh yeah, I just kind of skim past verses because like, oh, I've already... I've already studied that for, for a long time. I know time. that, right? right? Yeah, yeah. Um, How do you, what do you say for, for those of us who struggle? Because like we feel like, oh, we've studied that passage. Let's just mm -hmm. skip it to move on. Well, I find that reengaging, reading, reading the whole can be really helpful. So yeah, I mean, I do kind of, a, I mean, in a sense, skimming because you're not going to stop at every point, but, you know, a thorough reading of the whole. Read it all the way through. Um, you know, maybe consider some points of historical context that might be relevant, read it again. Does that kind of shift any of the, oh, that makes that sound a bit different? Or, or this time around I heard, you know, like in verse four, verse seven, um, uh, the Lord is near. This little phrase that comes in the midst of exhortations. Mm -hmm. Does that mean the Lord is near to me, as in a psalm that it might be echoing? Or does it mean the time of the Lord is near, as we've just heard in chapter three, the, oh. you know, the kind of eschatological picture of soon Christ will return and, oh. and give life to our, you know, we'll kind of make his, our bodies like his body, you know, wow, that's, so, and does Paul mean there to be an ambiguity there? Is this an intentional both and, or is it one or the other? You know, so I, I don't think I heard that ambiguity until, you know, a number of times reading through and go, oh, is that intentional or not? What is Paul doing there? How does it fit within his context? So having those moments of going, oh, that is more complex than I thought. And it's, there's a beauty in both of those. And the answer is never, well, oh, I want it to be both, so it's both. But some people have argued that there is intentional ambiguity there. It's, it's you know, Paul doesn't do a lot of play on words, but this might be one of them. And the interesting is there's no setup for it. There's no introductory conjunction. So it, it seems to be able to go either direction. And if you bring it one direction, it leans more toward the one and toward the other with the other direction. And anyway, you know, something to, to go a little deeper with. Yeah. Well, Dr. Brown, I want to thank you so much for writing this fantastic commentary on Philippians and also for coming on the show. Yeah, it was my pleasure to be with you. Thank you.